startups. But when we leave the state, usually we'll use the, checklist. Uh, the startup checklist. So I figured, what the hey, I'll give you a little. And if you guys are here tomorrow, is, is anybody not here tomorrow? Everybody here tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on to those, and then I'll have to give you another one, because I'm going to do a, a class on uh, winterization <coughs> and spring startup. Uh, yeah, right. If you don't winterize or start up in your neck of the woods, this tomorrow will be way more in depth to how to how to configure it. The, the startup portion will benefit you. The winterization, you probably care less. <laughs> you don't do anything in can, can you give me a vial of No. I don't know that. Uh, Good point. I haven't done anything in flight. I've only been breathing these guys for like two and a half years. So, yeah. and I, don't have a, I don't have a pump station on a golf course yet. So outside of that, like stuff, there's not a whole lot of your gates there. There's not a whole lot of your gates there. All right. We're going to leave the stragglers behind. So as I told you all this morning, my name is Dave. I'm the service manager, tech support. I help everybody do whatever. Uh, so we're going to talk today about startups. And this, for our class sake, will be pretty much a crash course. I'm mostly going to focus on what not to do, because there's a lot of wrong ways to do it. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to pass this around. I didn't feel like it was worth printing. This is what we call up a startup, uh, a startup request form. So when we have a, a customer that says, hey, I'm ready for startup, I'll email them that form. And you'll, you'll read it. Basically, it says, I have power. <laughs> I have water. So all the ingredients. I have the ability to pump some water. I have the place to put the water. <laughs> right? I will have all of my operators, anyone that needs training on site. There's some other items in there. There's, there's also things in there like a contact name and number for a guy on site that will be there so that I can call him and he can show me where the pump station is on the site. Uh, and also an address, GPS coordinates, Google Maps, whatever, to get me there. Another thing I was thinking about adding is what airport should I fly to? <laughs> right now I've got a job, I'm like, holy cow drive for two hours come on uh, so that's that's a pretty good pretty good resource if you don't already have something like that I'd recommend you get one that way if you show up like I did a couple of weeks ago in Oregon and they have everything but water you can send them a bill yeah. right otherwise they can be like oh no we're not ready yet come back next week and you're like I just drove for five hours Right. You don't so you're saying game. you, up until now, haven't used that form? Oh, no, we've been using it. We're just, we refine it as we go. And uh, we also have a startup. So you got dry docked? <laughs> I you can't even tell you how many times. Water? I can't even tell you how many times. Yeah, we're ready to start up. I show up, they don't even have power. Yeah, I, know that. I get, I get calls water. every spring. Yeah. I need you to come start up my pump station. All right, do you have water? Well. Not yet. <laughs> Tell me when you do. So what, do you want me to bring a water truck? Five-gallon <laughs> <laughs> bucket? I mean, I, I can make some things happen. I mean, we filled up a sump with a fire hydrant one time to do a startup. And then we pumped that water back into the sump. Well, it's kind of hard to calibrate sleep settings when you do that, but they were in a big-ass hurry, so we made it happen. Uh, now, let's say... Let's say we've got all the ingredients for a successful startup. We've got everybody on site, pump stations all hooked up, ready to go, powered up. Uh, really, the first thing you want to do is just kind of look over the installation. Make sure that the valves are open, the check valves are pointing in the right direction, things like that. Because, uh, you know, when we, when we ship these things, sometimes we finished testing like these valves they're all shut <laughs> they're all shut <laughs> so that's something we would want to be aware of before starting it up now 
not a poke at Chris Hudson or anything. It's also helpful to bring a meter. <laughs> For a number of reasons, most of which is, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the power connected before we turn it on and subject all our electronics to it is what the system is rated for. Uh, I don't know if it was my first year teaching drive programming, but like the day before the class, somebody brought in a drive and said, hey, I'd figure out what's wrong with it. So I hooked up power to it and I turned on the power and boom! It was a 240 volt drive. And I hooked up 480. So I was like, hey, I figured out what was wrong with that drive. <laughs> <laughs> the input's blown. Wow, that was fast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I was like, I, I told him, I told him what happened. That was a, a hard lesson. It was a hard lesson on check the voltage before you power something up. Now, once we trust the voltage and never, never power it up with the door open, especially the first time. I will close the door, I will latch every single latch, and I stand off to the side like this, and nobody is in front of it, and power it up. Now, if I want it to remain powered, and I need to open the door, I've got a Leatherman. He's going to poke more fun at Chris. There's a little knob on the side of the disconnect handle. Some of them will have like a little flat head knob to turn to defeat the shaft lock. Now you're dangerous. There's a trick. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so... Just remember the power's kind of, on when yeah, you open the fan. <laughs> it's kind of a gray area when you're talking about a qualified technician. Yeah. Now, in it's my like world, if right? I'm on the phone yeah. with, you know, Joe Blow, well driller guy, and I say, hey, I need you to open the door with the power on, and he's asking me how to do it, <laughs> I'm probably going to tell him to call an electrician. So, you know, I'm going to leave it up to you guys to decide whether you're qualified. And then you can deal with the state laws if you so choose. Uh, now, for the first time startup, I'm not looking for burnt crispy wires. We'll talk about that tomorrow. First time startup, I just want to look in here and make sure there's nothing obviously ludicrous about this. Uh, I don't turn on breakers with the door open. Even if I trust them, I'll turn the power off, turn on a breaker, close the door and latch it, turn the power on. I haven't been blown up yet, but I imagine it doesn't feel very good. Throw your hair. So hot, molten plastic, and metal. Well, let's re rewind a little bit. Hey Dave, do you do the setup first? I mean, do you typically do the setup? Like in the case where you're going to do a startup, did you set the pump station and you hook everything together? Only on local jobs. Okay. So if we sold it in the valley here, we'll deliver the pump station, we'll set the pumps, connect all the piping, then they come in with their electrician and their mechanical guy to make the, the field connections. Uh, but, and I guess something else to know on local jobs is we don't flow test them in the shop if they're going to be local. But everything we ship out of state is flow tested, performance tested, leaks, you know, we we know that it's performing to the spec. So a voltage, we're going to test A to B, A to C, and B to C. They should all be within 3% of your incoming voltage rating. So let's say it's 480. If you're 460, you may have a little bit of a problem. Now that you've tested each one to each other, you test each one to ground. So on 480, it should be 277 to ground, 277, 277. On 208, it should be 120. And on 240, like 130. So now that, now that we trust the incoming power, we're going to close that door back up and latch it and power it up. And we've got a voltage monitor in here. 
not all of them have voltage monitors and I'm not going to trust this whole system on that thing working. It's the very first time, that's why I'm checking it with my meter. So, there's, there's a few things that you're going to want to be aware of, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow. Everybody's going to be here tomorrow. I'm pretty sure Chris will be here. So I'll skip over some of this boring stuff. But the pressure switch, high pressure switch, uh, will need to be tested. So the way to test that, I'll go in way more detail tomorrow, so don't feel like I'm leaving you behind if you don't get all this right away. First of all, we gotta we gotta turn that high pressure relief valve off. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow, and then we'll talk about how to raise the pressure up. And I'm not gonna bore you today with that, but tomorrow we will get in, in some pretty good depth. Test the high pressure switch. We want to know where it's gonna be, you know, coming on at <coughs> the high pressure switch. We want about 15 pounds above our set point. We want our high pressure relief valve about 10 points above our set point. And the reason you want that so far above your set point on the high pressure relief valve is that it opens at a higher pressure than it closes. So when, as the pressure comes back down, if you want it to close and then still go down a little bit more before the pumps come back on and maintain their operational pressure setting. Uh, if you have a flow meter, I hope you all have flow meters. It's also a really important to test performance of each pump. So the best way to do that is have the irrigation guy or landscaper, whoever, open up some zones, just leave them open for our, for our testing. And we wanna start each pump in hand, full speed. Now on the inside of our spec label, you will see that each pump and each motor has its own little design point as, as well as the whole system. So each pump we can test individually, uh, running at full speed, but the main pump station isolation valve, we can shut it until we get it to its designed pressure, and then read flow. Now, most of the ones I've tested overperform, which is great, so we want to make sure we're at least performing on each individual pump. Uh, oh. Let me get these checklists. So, let's say you have a pump that's underperforming and it's a submersible, for our argument's sake, because this is a submersible station. How are you gonna, how are you gonna know if it's running backwards or forward? Swap Jump. the wire average. Oh, sorry. Nope, you're, you're good. Swap the wire. Swap the, so that's how you would reverse it to test it if the other direction performs better. Check the amperage, get some flow, see if the pressure drops off. Check the amperage against the flow. Yeah, get some flow going, and if your amperage doesn't come up to nameplate amperage when you're flowing the correct amount out of it, chances are it's worth trying to swap the wires before you go through all that. If you got a VFD, you can make it go backwards on the drive itself running off the keypad. You, you can't then, in remote mode though. Huh? You can't in remote mode though. Oh, you can do it off the drive keypad. Yeah, in local mode. Go yeah. reverse. I usually end up doing that first before I open up the drive, take off the, unless it's got the block there, but even with that, it takes a few minutes. I might as well spin it backwards, see if it corrects the problem. Another way to, because we're all right, another way to do that is I'll shut the isolation valve all the way, put it in hand and dial it up, if it doesn't get above like 30 or 40 pounds, it's going backwards. Oh yeah. Oh, sometimes they'll you're already, already, you're find that pressure though. though. Sometimes it's, they will. We, we hadn't got there. You're jumping you ahead. I don't know. It's not performing. You what guys, do you do? You guys gotta keep me on my toes, <laughs> all right? Uh, so that, it, you know, and if you have a centrifugal pump, there's an arrow <laughs> on the volute. And in fact, if you look at it, it's gonna be pretty obvious. Okay, I want it to go that way. And then you look at the shaft. There are certain designs you can't see the shaft. So you look in the back of the motor for which way the fan is going. Yeah. But you got to catch it when it's either starting or stopping. Right. Yeah. And on a vertical multi-stage pump, there's metal plates on the side where the shaft for the pump and motor meet with a couple. Um, 
if it's a centrifugal pump, you'll want to make sure that, you know, if you have a, a packing seal, you want to make sure that the correct amount of water is coming out of the seal. Now let me ask you this. We got we got some smart guys there. How much water should be coming out of a packing pump seal? A packing seal? A packing seal. Just drip. Drip. Yeah, and, and I also heard it said that if you feel the water and it's hot, you need a little bit more flow. You need a little bit more drip. And I, I hadn't even thought about it until somebody had told me. That's why I'm asking you guys. Yeah. Because I know how I do it. Uh, but I, I agree with you. You just want, you know, a drip, 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 drip. If it's spraying everywhere, you need to tighten it down. If there's none coming out, holy crap. There's steam coming out. <laughs> there's steam coming out. <laughs> now, mechanical seals, you know, as long as nothing's coming out, you're probably good. And don't let someone tell you, hey, it's leaking right out the bat. Oh, it's got to break in. Wrong. They don't got to break in. They're supposed to seal immediately. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. I had a call uh, last year, and... Uh, it was a homeowner and a subdivision, and the guy's just freaking out. There's there's water coming out of your propeller. There's water coming out of the propeller. I'm, okay, shut it off. Okay, I don't have a propeller on the station, but if there's water coming out, that's not good. So, so we go out there. The guy didn't understand. We had told him twice. I was there for one of them, and my tech you know, explained to me that he had told him on a separate occasion when when it's leaking really bad and you want to tighten down a pack and pump, while it's running, tighten it down a little tiny bit at a time until you get it to that weep, right? So he, it was coming out pretty good. So he shuts the pump off and tightens it down as tight as it'll go and turns it back on and the whole packing land, boom! <laughs> so uh, the propeller was leaking water, you know? So luckily that was an easy fix, but that kind of leads me into the next part of how to adjust the packing on a packing pump. Now if it's not coming out enough, you can kind of loosen it up a little bit and then wedge the packing gland up until you get to that point. Now if you can't get it to that point, hopefully you have spare packing in your truck, which we don't typically, but we almost never have that problem. Uh, also, if you bottom out and it's still leaking, you've got to replace the packing. But we're talking new startups. All right. Mm -hmm. New startups. So let's go down our list, guys. Check overloads. This is one of those things that should have been done here. And if it's not set right, our quality control is very poor. However, it is a good idea to check the overload settings, especially on lag pumps that start across the line. Now, each of these breakers, I know I call them breakers, they're thermal and magnetic. So it acts as an overload and overcurrent protection in one device. Has an adjustable current setting on it. Our overloads, if you have a different type of overcurrent protection, have a very similar knob. So each across the line pump or pumps that have potential to be run across the line have this adjustable overload by code. Now if they're on drive, the drive is an acceptable means of overload protection, which is basically protecting the windings within the motor. Everything else is protecting the wire. Uh, so, you know, we want to look at the nameplate of the motors. If we don't have the nameplate on the door, <coughs> We should have the nameplate of each motor on the door, unless it's uh, above ground. Take your FLA full load amp, and it should match the setting on this dial. Now the ABB overload protection we use already has the 115% built in. Right, so if you open up the code book, it'll say, hey, take this FLA and multiply it by your service factor, which is a 1.15 typically. So that would be 115%. You don't have to do any of that if you're using an ABB overload. It already takes that into consideration. 
Um, some circuit breakers do have trip ratings. Um, mostly just the really big ones. 800 ampers, where you can go from 600 amps to 800 amps. You can adjust the trip curve, you know, the rising current, where it'll trip on that. Uh, so that's what that is about. Inspecting and cleaning the enclosures, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you see a rat nest, you might want to get it out. Uh, we'll talk more about mice tomorrow. They're bad. They're bad. Mice are bad. Hornets too. Hornets suck. You know, well, I just sent a couple of guys out to uh, Grandview, change out a motor today, and uh, I was giving them some of the tools out of my work truck, and he sees I got a whole case of wasp spray, and he's like, "What the heck's that?" I'm like, "Oh, you'll find out." Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you'll be glad it's there. All righty. So, again, some of these next items really you shouldn't have to do on a first time startup. Wait a minute, I'm on the wrong checklist. Let me get on the checklist. We're going to the system startup checklist. Don't laugh at me. It's not funny. Okay, but we're in the same, we're in the same type of questions here. <laughs> Okay, let's check circuit breaker connections and trip reading. So checking the field strip for proper connections. We're talking about the low water float, which we cannot connect here at the shop because it's going to go down in the water. We're talking about if they've got a rainbird clock for remote starting. If they've got, you know, I'll look in here and any terminal that doesn't have a wire, I look at what it is and then I try and figure out if it's supposed to be there is how I do it. Most of the time on a package pump system it's all pre-wired. Uh, but there are, now that we've you know been doing some of these kind of oddball jobs, sometimes we'll ship the panel separate from the pump station in which case you'll have to look at it a little bit closer. But hopefully you purchase a certified startup and have one of our guys going out there in that occasion. Sometimes if there's no remote start you gotta put a jumper in. May or may not be there. Uh, and also, I'm not sure when you can do your, your PLC menu navigation class. Uh, you can turn off remote start too. On the new one. On the new one. Yeah. I think you're right. The old ones you had to. Yeah, you had to put jump on. Yeah. Okay, so if there is an Amiot filter. Um, Ah, no, let's talk about that after we've pressurized our main line. Because <laughs> uh, I don't even want to test it until there's water. All right, so let's talk about our main line. On a first time startup, it's probably full of air. Air compresses really well and water doesn't. So what you'll get is water hammer mixed with these huge oscillations and pressure. Uh, the best way to do it is to turn on the very smallest pump you've got, the pony pump, with the open isolation valve, and just turn the speed pot all the way down, put it into hand mode, the pump should start, dial it up nice and slow, I'll leave it, you know, at 45 hertz or whatever, see if it starts building any pressure after a couple of minutes, if it does, and I'll raise it up to 60. And then I'll let it run for five minutes or so. Now, if I'm not building up any pressure at all, I'll start asking questions like, how far out is your main line? Are you pumping up a hill? You know, questions like, um, do you have any open valves? Because by now, we should be seeing some pressure. Now, if we're pumping up a hill, which we've got a bunch out there like that, I'll start up a main pump. Same protocol. Speed pot all the way down. Then start the main pump. It'll tell you on the touch screen which is the main pump. You want to start that one in hand and then slowly dial it up. So finally we're starting to see some pressure. All right. So once we get up to like the 15, 20 pound, turn it off. And what you'll see is it'll go 15, 20, 0, 20, 5. It'll be bouncing all over the place. That's just let her calm down. Once it's calmed back down, I'll start it back up. I'll let it run up to 
you know, 30 pounds, and I'll turn it off. Let it calm down. So we're getting all the, the air out through the air release. I'll, I'll repeat that as many times as necessary, depending on the system, for me to feel comfortable that, you know, way out there, we're not just kicking the crap out of their equipment. So once I've got it up to 40, 50 pounds, now I'm assuming it's an irrigation application or, or a potable application where our set point is, you know, between 50 and 80 pounds. Once I get up to 40 or so, I'll just pop it in the auto and let it take off. Now, I don't want anything on right now. I want it to fall asleep. Now I'm gonna put everything in auto. I'm gonna tell Mr. Landscape Man or Mr. City Guy, go open a hydrant or a zone, you know, start opening stuff up. Let the pumps turn themselves on in stages. Boom, boom, all right, everybody turned on right when I wanted them to. All right, now start closing stuff off. Boom, boom, boom. All right, everybody fell back asleep. Now, the most important part is done. We know it's going to start when we want it to. We know it's going to stop when we want it to. So, you know, most of the safety issues that go with the startup are, are covered in that, in that test. Now, another thing, if, and, and here we are talking irrigation again, if, if we've got 20 different zones, they're all going to be different sizes, right? 200 gallons a minute, 100 gallons a minute. I want to. I want you to find your smallest zone and run it all by itself. <clears throat> and whoever turns on, that's fine. And then turn that valve off, or shut that hydrant, or you know whatever small demand. And I want to make sure the pony falls asleep with the sleep settings that are in it. Now, if we have a flow meter, we can calibrate. Uh, our main sleep by the flow meter by gallons per minute and if you, you know if you think about it if uh, if your pony pump is 50 gallons a minute then your main sleep should be about 40 gallons a minute because at 40 gallons a minute that pony should be able to take over no problem if you don't have a flow meter uh, you just want to make sure that the sleep frequency Right, sleep by frequency or sleep by flow. Sleep by flow, if, if it works, it works better. Uh, and I'll go off on a little tangent here. If you're sleep by frequency and you want to change your set point, your sleep frequency may change as well because at, we'll say, a higher pressure, the pump will have to go faster to maintain it at no flow. So that's why, personally, sleep by flow is the way to go. Who would even rhyme? Because it kind of covers the operators from, you know, changing the set point and all of a sudden the pump doesn't go to sleep and they don't even get it. It doesn't make any sense to them. Uh, so, yeah, like I was saying, the, the sleep frequency on the, on the pony with the very lowest demand you can possibly get on it and then when it shuts off, if the pony falls asleep, your sleep settings are done. Now, if it doesn't, then whatever frequency it's going at, Let's say you shut off that valve, and your sleep frequency is 32, which is what we usually program, <coughs> and it settles up at 34. Then you would change that sleep frequency. I'd go 35 and a half or 36, just to give a little extra fudge factor in there for you know wear on the impellers over time to make sure that it will successfully sleep you know, for probably a couple of years they wouldn't have to recalibrate it as long as their system doesn't change. So now we've got a full pipe of water. We're running zones. So how, how can we test the automation of this filter? Because this filter is, I mean, it's not like rocket science complicated, but it's not exactly like simple. Uh, with the Amiot filters and the, the valve and filter filters, they all operate off differential pressure. So pressure before the filter is compared to pressure after the filter. When that difference reaches seven pounds, it triggers a flush cycle. So to test the automation part of the filter, we need to kind of trick it into seeing differential pressure greater than seven pounds. Now, Amiad, oh boy, let's see if we can find this buddy. There's 
there's a little three-way valve on the supply line for the pressure differential switch. And if you guys haven't seen it or don't know what I'm talking about, come on over here and I'll show you. Uh, yeah, come on. The other end. Let's all climb in there. Yeah. Damn. They're always mounted upside down so you can't read them from the top. Oh, yeah.